Good afternoon, everybody. Looks like everybody uh, has been able to get in at this point. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to a virtual welcome to the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Uh, my name is John Gravy, and I am the director of the Rudman Center, and I also teach at the law school. And we're so pleased, uh, we've been so pleased to be able to partner with the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education uh, for a civic engagement series uh, over the course of this fall. Uh, and today is the concluding event in that collaboration. Uh, today's event is titled, Is Civic Learning a Constitutional Right? Um, and uh, to introduce uh, today's speakers and to say a little bit more about our collaboration um, and um, the event, uh, is uh, Martha Madsen, who is the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education. So, Martha. Thank you, John, and welcome everybody. Um, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education is so grateful to partner with the Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service here at the law school to bring you this very timely discussion on the importance of civic learning for civic strength. The series of lectures, and this is the last of the of five this fall, as John said, were made possible through the generosity of the William W. Treat Foundation. Like Senator Warren Rudman, Judge William W. Treat was a believer in the respectful exchange of ideas across party lines to advance the public good. William Treat was an advocate for human rights, a diplomat, a New Hampshire probate judge, author, and banker. He served as a public delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. And we are honored to host these lectures in his memory and to continue his legacy. I also would like to thank our constitutionally speaking partners who make all of this happen. The New Hampshire Humanities, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, Citizens Count, and of course, the Rudman Center at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. I'm so thrilled to introduce our speakers tonight. Um, first, welcome to Professor Michael Rebell, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Educational Equity at Teachers College, Columbia University. As a professor of both law and education, he has authored many books and articles, including Flunking Democracy, Schools, Courts, and Civic Participation. His areas of interest are educational equity, civic education, and the role of courts in reform. On behalf of several Rhode Island youth and their families, Professor Rebell is suing the state of Rhode Island in federal court, arguing that failure, failure to prepare students to be capable citizens deprives them of a fundamental right under the US Constitution. Also joining us today is Jennifer Wood. She is co-counsel in this suit called Cook versus Raimondo and she is the executive director of the Rhode Island Center for Justice. Jen is a graduate of Brown University and Northeastern School of Law, and she has over 30 years experience in public interest law. And we're very fortunate today um, to have one of the suit's plaintiffs with us. Um, please welcome Nancy Zong, who was born in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, she is a child of the Hmong genocide um, her parents were survivors of that genocide, and she is um, a children of two parents who were survivors. Her relatives fought against the Communist Party in Laos. Nancy's parents survived and arrived in the U.S. with hopes for freedom and opportunity. Um, Nancy and her family found the opportunities hard to take advantage of, given the language barrier, cultural difference, and not a lot of guidance. Nancy is now a first-generation college student, and she's committed to advocate for opportunities for the next generation to thrive, not just survive. So let's begin. We're going to begin with Professor Rebell. Thank you very much, Martha, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, and uh, I really uh, appreciate the uh, effort that um, uh, the Civics Institute and the Redmond Center have put into organizing this um, uh, very interesting series. Um, <clears throat> what Martha asked me to do to set the stage for today's discussion uh, is give you a little background about um, 
why I felt um, motivated to bring this constitutional claim in federal court, uh, how we developed it. Uh, and then uh, uh, my colleague, Jen, is going to tell you a little more, bring you up to date on um, uh, where we are with the decision that was just issued in the case about a week ago and what the future may hold. So this case actually uh, goes back almost 50 years to 1973 when the US Supreme Court decided a major case, San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. And um, the Rodriguez case uh, dealt directly with the issue of uh, what's called um, uh, fiscal equity, uh, fairness in, um, in funding um, for students. Um, sorry, I'm just fiddling around with trying to open up my speaker view here so I can see myself. Um, well, uh, I won't see myself, I'll see all of you. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so this was a case brought by a uh, very uh, poor uh, district in um, the San Antonio, uh, Texas area. Uh, these kids were um, uh, in great need of educational services, uh, but the uh, school district didn't have the resources to provide them uh, what they needed. And in fact, on a per capita basis, they were receiving about half as much funding as a wealthy district next door. Uh, so the case went to the US Supreme Court. Most people at the time thought that based on Brown v. Board of Education, uh, which had been decided uh, about uh, two decades earlier, uh, this would be a logical next step. If you're going to desegregate the schools, if you're gonna provide equal opportunity to all children, uh, you had to equalize the funding. Um, but uh, somewhat to the surprise of most observers, uh, that case uh, turned out uh, not to be uh, uh, yielding a, a decision in the plaintiff's favor. Uh, by a close 5-4 margin, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that education is not a right under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, they emphasize that there's not a word about education in the Constitution. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the federal courts um, would not entertain uh, any uh, future cases uh, that deal with uh, inequities in education funding. Now, that's the reason that um, uh, all subsequent litigations that have dealt with problems of education funding have been in the state courts. And I know in New Hampshire, uh, many of you are familiar with the Claremont case, the various um, uh, reiterations of that case, compliance issues, uh, and other uh, litigations that have gone on for um, uh, almost a quarter of a century now in New Hampshire. Same things happened in just about every other state. We've had litigations in 48 state courts because now this question of adequate education, fair funding in education has largely been a matter of state court jurisdiction. And um, uh, you've had a wide variety of outcomes in these cases. Plaintiffs have won basically 60% of the state education funding cases. They've lost about 40% of them. And there've been a, a whole range of uh, remedies that courts have issued in these cases. This is really an example of um, uh, what uh, has been called the laboratory of the states uh, in our federal system. Uh, we've had all kinds of different approaches. Um, so New Hampshire had one experience, neighboring Vermont had a very different experience. They had one case, they had quick compliance and they didn't uh, go through the many iterations of continuing litigation that you've had in New Hampshire. Well, um, I've been involved in a number of these litigations around the country. And um, the main one was the case I brought in New York State known as Campaign for Fiscal Equity versus State of New York. Uh, and uh, we were able to prevail in that case. It took us many years, much effort, uh, but we won a, a strong victory. We got more funding for schools uh, in New York State um, but the other thing that happened in that case is 
aside from getting more money for the schools, um, the court focused on the question of what is the basic purpose of education? Uh, their reasoning was, uh, if we're gonna consider whether the state is spending enough money to provide kids um, the kind of sound basic education, that's the phrase in our constitution, to which they're entitled, um, we have to know what's the purpose of education. We can't figure out how much money you need until we know what it should go for. Then we can examine what's going on in the schools, see if they're meeting the purpose. And if they're not, uh, is lack of money the cause? And if that's the cause, how much money they need to improve it. So that was the logical process. In any event, when they focused on this event, uh, on this definition, what was really fascinating is that this court in the 21st century went back to the early days of the Constitution, the early days of the establishment of the common school system in America, and went to first principles. What was the purpose of education according to the founders of our Constitution? Um, basically, it was to uh, ensure the vitality and the perpetuation of the experiment, it really was an experiment in those days, of uh, mass democracy that they were establishing uh, in this new world setting. And um, I'm sure many of you uh, have, have uh, become familiar uh, through this series, if not before, with the many statements from George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, about how um, educating our citizens to understand uh, democracy, democratic values, uh, to be able to exercise free speech, to be able to vote intelligently. That, that was the essence of the democratic system. So um, skip ahead 225 years and our uh, highest court in New York State declared that um, the purpose of education, uh, the constitutional right that they were declaring um, obtains for every young person in the, in the whole state was a right to uh, obtain the skills they need to function productively as civic participants capable of voting and serving on a jury. In other words, core civic values are the primary purpose of education. Now that's not to deny that education also prepares students for the world of work. That was productive citizenship in, in our court's terms. But this emphasis on citizenship really impressed me. And by the way, uh, that's not to say that other state courts that have dealt with these issues uh, didn't come up with similar definitions. As a matter of fact, the New Hampshire Supreme Court in the Claremont case um, spoke in similar, very strong terms about how important education was and why it is the essence of the constitutional right uh, to a... Uh, a equal educational opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick quote from the New Hampshire Supreme Court decision in Claremont. Our, quote, our society places tremendous value on education. Education provides the key to individual opportunities for social and economic advancement and forms the foundation for our democratic institutions and our place in the global economy. So that's the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And when I've subsequently started looking into this area, I've actually identified 32 state Supreme Courts and mostly in these adequacy cases, sometimes in a few others that have similarly declared that either the prime purpose of education or one of the prime purposes of education is preparing kids for effective citizenship. Um, the other 18 states haven't denied that, they just haven't used those words. So that got me to thinking, this is rather incredible that um, the uh, highest court in my state, in most states, is saying civic education is the prime purpose of education. And then you look at the schools and you say, what's going on in these schools? Well, if you go back a decade or so, when I started thinking about this, what was going on was NCLB emphasizing basic math and um, uh, literacy skills, which are important. But the way it was being presented, um, social studies was being downgraded, civics especially was being downgraded. And there are a lot of other reasons. You can go back 50 years 
uh, to the Vietnam War and when um, uh, the, the civic attitudes towards government institutions started changing, um, uh, a whole range of issues uh, for why uh, the schools were more and more pulling back from emphasizing civics, from teaching it effectively. I don't have time to go into all of that. Suffice it to say that um, we had budget cuts in our state, most states around 2009, 10 after the Great Recession. We did a quick survey of what the impact of the cuts were. And the thing that stood out to me was the first thing to go when there was financial constraint was anything that had to do with teaching kids to be prepared uh, to be effective citizens. So that meant extracurricular activities like debate, uh, student government, student newspapers. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, social studies teaching was being downgraded. Uh, there's something wrong here, I was saying to myself. The, uh, the courts in our state and most states are saying that preparing kids for citizenship is the essence of education, but it's the lowest priority when you look around about what's being done. So um, one of the fringe benefits I get from having an academic position is every few years you get a sabbatical. I got one a few years ago. I took that time to research this uh, issue in some depth, led me to um, write a book, um, which I think Martha mentioned. And in, in doing the research for the book, I realized that um, although I was critical of the current state of civic education and many, many people who had studied this more than I had, I found there was a whole literature on this. And it's not that uh, educators and scholars, university people didn't know how to improve it. There were all kinds of great ideas about how to improve civic education, uh, but nothing was being done. Matter of fact, you had major um, uh, commissions appointed by governors. In California, the chief justice convened a major commission that came up with some wonderful recommendations about how civic education could be improved. On the federal level, uh, you had a commission that was headed by former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. They came up with great recommendations. But all of these commission reports wound up on the back shelf. And I reached the conclusion that um, although everybody gives lip service to the fact that we need to improve education, they don't really move on it. It doesn't get the resources. It doesn't get the attention. It doesn't get the priority status uh, that it needs in the schools um, because it just uh, is not a priority. How do you make it a priority? Well, uh, given my own background uh, with uh, uh, litigation, with seeing the role courts can play and they do play in many other areas, special education, um, uh, gender equity, all kinds of areas, um, it uh, just became my understanding and my position that you're not going to get fundamental change, you're not going to get civic education to get the priority status it needs unless there is some intervention by the courts to make sure that this happens. So that led me on the path of thinking about a litigation direction. And uh, you know, the fact is, even though 32 state courts uh, have said civic education is important, uh, it's been a mixed bag and uh, a very minimal mixed bag on what they've done to follow it up. Uh, these statements generally come in these cases dealing with money. Many of these courts have issued decrees requiring states to spend more money, but then they don't follow up on what the money's being spent on. And even though they may have said civics is very important, um, none of the state courts have really enforced that understanding. Um, so that's why it, it became clear to me that if we're going to have an impact, it's got to be in federal court. And, uh, you know, when you go around, you ask people in, in New York and New Hampshire and any other state, is there a right to education, a constitutional right to education? Most people will say yes, because they assume there's a right under the federal constitution. There isn't, as, we, as we've learned, at least not in general terms. Um, but the fact that there is a right under the state constitution somehow doesn't register. 40% um, of the state courts have said they're not gonna enforce any right. Many other state courts have said it is a right we'll enforce, but 
Uh, the extent to which it's been fully enforced may be questionable. New Hampshire may be in that category. Um, what we needed was uniformity. What we needed was clarity. What we needed was legitimacy that would come out of a clear ruling um, from the federal courts and especially the US Supreme Court. So that became our goal. And putting it into effect um, uh, became my mission when I returned to Columbia after my uh, sabbatical. Um, and what I managed to do, um, this is another fringe benefit of um, being in academia. Uh, I was able to draw upon uh, some very good free student labor. I set up a seminar. It was a seminar on preparing a federal litigation uh, to uh, establish a right to an adequate education for citizenship. And um, the class was basically half education students from Teachers College and half law students from Columbia Law School. And um, the students had a great time. Um, first thing they did was read the uh, draft copies um, uh, of my book. So they knew a lot about the background and what the problem was. But then we got into this question of, uh, let's draw up a complaint. Let's think through what are all the education issues that we have to look at, that we have to research and understand, and what are the legal issues? Uh, what kind of strategies are we going to have? Uh, and going through all of this, as we started drafting the complaint, we got to the point where um, by the end of the semester, uh, we had a pretty solid legal document. Uh, and the question became, where are we going to file this? It's a federal case. And you could actually file it in any of the 50 states. I, I remember calling um, uh, Ted O'Connell, uh, Ted McConnell, who uh, is the head of the um, uh, civic mission of the schools. I think Ted was a speaker in this series a few weeks ago. You know, he's kind of the dean of all the uh, advocates and researchers in this field. He's been at it many years. He knows everybody in every state. I called him up and I said, Ted, I want to bring this litigation. Tell me um, what state do you think would be the best one to bring? Which one is not doing an adequate job with civic education for their kids? And Ted said to me, Michael, you could bring this case in any of the 50 states. None of them are doing an adequate job. Um, but you ought to look into which one would be the best setting, uh, would give you the best facts for the case that you want to bring. So um, that's the thing we did. Uh, with my seminar, we said, we have to pick uh, the venue, where should we bring this case? And uh, we went through a process. First of all, we eliminated all the cases where the uh, plaintiffs had won. Uh, we wanted to go into a state where they had lost because first of all, uh, in the, this is in the civic, uh, in the uh, fiscal equity cases. Uh, so we wouldn't go to New Hampshire, we wouldn't go to New York, but we wanted one of the 40% where their own state courts had said you got no right at all. You know, at least in New York and New Hampshire, if you wanna push civic education, you have the option of going to the state courts, but you don't in the 40% where the courts have washed their hands of doing anything as, as far as a right to education. And to make a long story short, we kind of focused on six states around the country, different geographic areas. And um, the assignment I gave the education students was look at their education systems, uh, see which ones seem to be crying out for the problems of providing decent civic education to the students. And to the law school, school students, I said, look at the legal decisions uh, in the circuit courts and the district decision, which would be a welcoming environment from uh, a legal point of view. And um, what it came down to when we looked at this is Rhode Island was kind of the perfect storm. Excuse me, Jen, I don't know if that's coming across as a compliment or an insult, but um, Rhode Island had more problems with civic education than almost any state we had looked at. Um, many states at least require a semester long course in civics, no requirement whatever in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, many other issues that Jen may get into where she briefly describes the complaint. Um, so uh, Rhode Island uh, would, would offer us uh, the kind of uh, uh, factual setting where we could describe and illustrate the problems in uh, inadequate civic education. As far as the courts were concerned, 
The Rhode Island courts are, um, uh, and the First Circuit in which it sits, um, are incredibly well balanced. Uh, even numbers of Republican Democratic uh, judges, um, people who have pretty solid backgrounds for looking fairly at the, at the facts. We wanted to bring a bipartisan case. Uh, so they, the judicial context looked very favorable for doing that. We knew this was gonna be a challenging case and we wanted to get a fair hearing and we felt we would in the Rhode Island District Court and in the First Circuit. The last element that we needed to look into is whether it would be community support. Uh, you know, I'm a New Yorker. If I go to a state like Rhode Island, I'm something of a carpetbagger. If I come in and say, we wanna bring a case in your state, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you think of that? Um, we needed to get people in the state uh, to be interested in this, to assist us, and to tell us really whether students, parents, the advocates for education in that state, do they see this as a good thing? We don't wanna come in and just start stirring something up that nobody wants. Uh, so I did reach out uh, through all my work nationally with these fiscal equity cases. I knew two of the lawyers in, in Rhode Island uh, who had brought their state cases and unfortunately had not succeeded in two rounds with the Rhode Island Supreme Court. They were encouraging and in saying, you know, we think this may be a real possibility for Rhode Island, Michael, why don't, why don't you come and talk to a wider group of folks? So I went uh, to Providence um, uh, the end of that uh, academic year that we were putting these plans together and uh, about a hundred people turned out, people from all over the state, educators, advocates, um, it was a really um, very impressive group. And I presented the outline of what we wanted to do. And there was a very strong positive reaction of people I gathered, I, I could really feel it. They were really frustrated that twice they had brought this case in the state Supreme Court. And uh, they felt that the court had just uh, turned uh, a blind eye on them. Uh, and they had gone to the legislature um, to see if they could get uh, reform in the school system. And um, the legislature was slamming the door on meaningful reform also. So people seem to welcome the possibility that um, there could be an opportunity through the federal courts. And um, at one of these early meetings, we had several follow-up meetings. It was my good fortune uh, that um, Jennifer Wood uh, decided to come and uh, see what was going on with this. And uh, she immediately took an interest and uh, immediately offered to help. And um, uh, she's been a great help ever since. Uh, Jen is our prime co-counsel. The other two lawyers are also co-counsel. So we have three very uh, active, experienced, and competent Rhode Island lawyers on the case. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Jen now to ask her to give you her perspective on um, having this carpetbagger come to town and why she decided to join with me and what it's led to ever since. Actually, it was a um, very interesting experience. Um, several colleagues reached out to me and said that this professor was coming to town to talk about the potential of bringing a challenge in court to establish a right to an adequate education for, to prepare young people to participate in the activities of civic participation as adults. And I had spent 10 years working at the State Department of Education, um, very passionate about the importance of education for preparing young people for success as adults. So that was kind of like, they had me at hello in that regard. But um, the interesting facet to this was that as, it, as I soon learned, this was kind of a reverse beauty contest. In other words, this professor was coming to find the worst state in the United States where this case could appropriately be brought. And so I thought, well, this is uh, kind of fun to see if we can win the ugly contest, which we did. Um, and I think that Michael's comments about the community support for bringing a case of this kind for really 
trying to push this issue forward uh, on behalf of the nation, but particularly in Rhode Island, really resonated because as Michael mentioned, we've had two challenges in, that went all the way to our state Supreme Court in Rhode Island, asserting a constitutional right to an adequate education for our young people under our state constitution. And our state Supreme Court has ruled not once but twice that although, con uh, although education is cited in our constitution as a critically important role for the state's government to fulfill, um, that right, so to speak, in our state constitution has been defined by our Supreme Court as whatever the elected officials in our state choose to make it. So they really deferred the entire question to a political question. And we have 39 cities and towns with discrete school districts in them in Rhode Island. And to get any kind of a uniform approach to an adequate education that would really prepare young people to succeed in adult life and participate in American democracy seemed virtually impossible given that level of fragmentation and given the real clarity in our state Supreme Court that they were not going to act to support students and to improve public education in our state. So we all uh, felt that all of our cards have been played at the local level and that we really needed to try a different approach. Also, I think that for local counsel, myself and the other two attorneys who had worked directly in the two challenges that went to our state Supreme Court, um, you know, we really were looking at the promise of Brown versus Board of Education and watching the decades tick by and seeing that our schools were really moving in the wrong direction from our perspective. I think uh, Michael referred to a number of these trends where rather than expanding the support for young people to have civic experiences, different really rich and deep learning experiences that take place both in the classroom and surrounding the classroom as part of the broader school experience, like um, the various extracurricular and enrichment activities like debate, like civic associations, like student government, like school newspapers, and really expanding the themes of learning in the social studies context, we saw that going in the opposite direction. There are no particular regulatory requirements under our state education regulations for any kind of uh, civic learning to take place in our schools. And given um, the national obsession with standardized testing of core areas, we saw that really being pushed out of our curriculum. Um, we've seen a trend of defunding libraries, defunding social studies, and I guess one of the most emblematic things that we point to in the complaint that we ended up filing in the federal court on behalf of our plaintiffs was that there was such a disinvestment and disregard for civic learning and social studies that even though our State Department of Education had a position for a social studies coordinator to support this kind of work statewide, that position had been vacant for nearly a decade. So that kind of, it kind of gave the image of nobody's home. Uh, and we felt that that would be a powerful image and argument to make to a judge to say, we really have a pretty serious gap here. Uh, and so after meeting um, Michael and hearing about the plan, the first thing he said to me was, go read the book. So I did, Plunking Democracy and um, chapter seven and eight, I'll never forget it, really address themselves to the legal theory of whether or not the, there's an opening. In we looked at all of the decisions that the United States Supreme Court has written talking about the constitution and education. And is there an opening in those prior Supreme Court decisions to suggest that maybe even though people tend to point to this San Antonio case as having closed that door, that maybe the door was really still open to find this right in the federal constitution. And because of a lot of work that we do with, um, so I work at a small nonprofit justice center and we have a lot of partnerships with other community organizations 
that is our model. We work exclusively in partnership with community organizations. So we had existing relationships with a number of student-led and student-directed um, ad advocacy organizations around the public schools. So as soon as we became aware that there's a potential for this kind of a challenge in Rhode Island, we went and started meeting with our friends and colleagues in the organizations in the public schools representing and working both with parents and students to see whether there was an interest among students to really um, call this out and stand up for their right to be better prepared as they leave school. And I can't think of a better time for us to be having this panel. I mean, we're as a nation about to have a presidential election next week. Um, a whole bunch of young people that we work with and have worked with in this case are going to be voting for the first time. This is a very fraught and complicated environment where we're experiencing um, electoral politics in the context of a global pandemic. That's a, that requires real preparation and I think deep civic knowledge and experiences such as are provided only through a public education that is infused with this teaching. A lot of people, uh, when we talk to people about this case say, oh, so uh, I guess you're fighting for a right to have a requirement in state law that there's a half credit course during high school in civics. To which I say, no, actually I wouldn't dedicate years of my life to achieving that goal. Um, the goal that we have is a, is a little bit more extensive than that which is to suggest that really in order to adequately prepare people to understand all of the issues that you need to understand in order to be an informed participant in democracy, in order to vote, in order to sit on a jury, in order to analyze which community you're gonna to move to because of the way they do local and state taxation. I mean, these are, it's quantitative, it's qualitative, it's history, it's uh, communication, all of the things that I associate with a full, rich, and deep quality education. And that is an education where these different experiences and learning opportunities take place from kindergarten to 12. It's not a course once in your career as a student. It is your entire career as a student being infused with these kinds of learning experiences in an equitable manner, in a way that we can say that everyone in the state is getting it, not just the students in the most well-resourced schools, um, but that this is generally available as a basic element of public education. So I think that the fact that that is not the case as we've assessed it in Rhode Island really brought us into communication with some very courageous young people who, um, including Nancy, who you're gonna hear from next, who said, you know, I'm not really sure what's involved with suing my state. That's a little intimidating, honestly. I'll never forget my first meeting with Nancy and another student. And, you know, they had a lot of questions for me. And I felt really good about the fact that they asked me a lot of hard questions about what would be involved in becoming a plaintiff in a lawsuit, which is basically taking on the power structure of the state government and challenging the status quo for public education in our entire nation. Um, but there were a group of families and students who said, this is important enough that I'm willing to lend my name and have it be placed on a, a filing in a federal court demanding that we really see dramatic improvements in public education when it comes to the manner in which students are being prepared for adult life and to participate in their constitutional rights of free speech, voting, jury, um, the, the whole suite of things that people have a right to as part of the constitution. So that's been a really powerful experience to be working with these courageous plaintiffs who put their name on this case and have stayed with us. You know, The other thing that is not easy to explain is that the wheels of justice grind slowly. Um, you know, we've been working with Nancy and others now for over two years, and we just got our first major decision in the case. So last December, after the, the state filed motions to dismiss the case, um, 
suggesting both that we had sued the wrong people, that we had the wrong plaintiffs, that we um, uh, had not articulated constitutional theories that would pass muster. Um, and so we had to respond to all of those different bases on which the case might be thrown out. And last December, uh, it was a really uh, wonderful experience to go in person, which we would not have been able to do if it were now, to go in person to the federal courthouse in Rhode Island. Many of the student plaintiffs and the families who had joined the lawsuit were present in the courtroom while the judge heard the arguments on the motion to dismiss. And um, he made it very clear that he thought it was a very important case and that he thought that the students and families that had stepped forward to really try and improve public education were doing their civic duty. Um, and he complimented the, the students who were in the room that day for taking up this cause. Um, but he had hard questions for both sides in the case. And then it took um, quite a long time to carefully consider all of the arguments made by the defendants in, in, as to why the case should be dismissed, but also listening to our arguments about why this, without a constitutional right, things are not going to change, that, that there just is not going to be an equitable and adequate education offered to people in the United States. So um, just a few weeks ago, we did receive a decision. And although unfortunately, uh, Judge Smith in ruling in our case did grant the motion to dismiss and indicated that the case would not go forward in the federal district court to trial at this time, he made it very, very clear that he thought that we had identified a major gap and flaw in the public education system. And the failure to focus on civics is a national crisis as he described it in his decision. He did not find, and very importantly, he decided that several of the arguments about whether we sued the right people with the right people and were in the right place, um, he uh, ruled against the defendants in those matters and narrowed our dispute to the constitutional question. In looking at that, he decided that uh, although we read the US Supreme Court cases, previous cases slightly differently, he acknowledged that perhaps there's an open door there, but that he didn't feel that the way that we're arguing for a right to civic education would meet that requirement. He acknowledged that perhaps a denial of all education might actually violate the constitution, but he left it for others to decide um, and he did definitely um, suggest that this situation needs to be remedied, whether by um, elected officials who fund and structure education or whether by other judges, it needs a solution. And so we are, we are preparing our appeal and we'll be going to the Court of Appeals to ask them to look at those US Supreme Court decisions about education and find that not only has the door been left open, but that particularly given our nation's current moment that we really need to find that there is a federally protected right so that we can have a national solution rather than this piecemeal patchwork quilt of litigation that caused Michael to say, enough is enough. We've got to come up with a solution so that young people can actually participate meaningfully and exercise their constitutional rights as adults. And that's the perfect opportunity for me to introduce Nancy because I know that we are hoping to hear from her as to what it was about um, her education experience up to the time when we began to think about bringing this case that caused her to think, yes, this is something that I wanna be involved in. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for introducing me. I just wanna quickly say thank you all for being here and Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about why I believe in this and why um, I continue to be involved and to fight for this. So a little background on me, as Martha said earlier, I am a child of genocide survivors and I grew up in a low income neighborhood. So I went to schools that didn't have resources or didn't have access to um, re to quality 
um, resources like textbooks or basic things like toilet paper. And I realized that I never learned about civics. I never learned about anything about voting, why it matter. I didn't learn about the different branches in government. And I also went to the top high school in Rhode Island. I went to classical high school where I was not taught why voting matters. I was not taught what is the role of our city council members or what is the role of the mayor and how can I get involved? And even having conversations in the Hmong community or with my own family, a lot of times people don't realize the importance of being engaged and the importance of voting, especially now. I just completed my mail ballot today. So it is my first time voting. And to explain the importance of voting and all that was very difficult because only this year I learned about civics education, voter suppression, and everything about um, the different branches and why it matter. And I got that from an educational justice organization. I didn't get that from school. I'm not getting that in college either. And just a quick story, um, this morning I was in my bio class and my professor told us to get involved and to vote. And that made me question, but yet the educational system are not equipping us with the tools to um, navigate how to be engaged and why it matters. And yeah, that's why I joined this case. I wanted to be a plaintiff to hope that things would be different for the next future generations so that this cycle of not knowing how to navigate life and not knowing your power in the systems. Okay, well, thank you, Nancy. Um, I just wanted, uh, before we go to the um, uh, question and answer, and, and we do welcome your comments and questions. Um, I wanted to just uh, pick up on one point that, that Jen described in very general terms, because I know that most of our law audience is probably lawyers and law students, and you're probably saying, um, well, what, what is your legal theory here? How plausible is it to go to the federal courts and talk about going up to the First Circuit uh, to assert a, a right under the US Constitution um, especially you've got the lower court judge uh, saying he granted a motion to dismiss. I think we've got a very strong argument. And um, uh, even if you read that decision carefully, um, the judge went light on us. He did not give uh, fundamental strong reasons, uh, explanations, citations for why he was turning us down. So let me just very briefly explain the main legal issue in the case. And it goes back to the Rodriguez decision from 1973. As I mentioned, by a close 5-4 vote, the Supreme Court uh, held that there's no right to education under the federal constitution. Uh, now, uh, the dissenters uh, were very, uh, very angry. Uh, maybe that, that's not the right word. Uh, they differed strongly from the majority here. Um, and Thurgood Marshall wrote the strongest, most pointed dissent on the point that we're interested in. And he was the one who came back to the majority and said, okay, there's not a word about education in the federal constitution, but there is a first amendment and there is a 15th amendment and students or citizens cannot uh, vote uh, effectively. They cannot exercise their first amendment rights to free expression, to um, petitioning their government if they don't have a basic education. Now, Justice Powell, who wrote the majority decision, obviously was concerned about that. And Powell knew a lot about education. He actually had been the president of the Virginia State Board of Education. And his retort to Justice um, Thurgood Marshall was, uh, we don't dispute that proposition that some quantum of education, that was a phrase he used, some quantum of education is necessary to exercise uh, citizenship rights. But he went on to say the plaintiffs in this case haven't presented evidence about what that quantum of education would mean. 
they said we're getting less money than people in the next district, but they didn't say they were getting less than the necessary quantum. So that's the issue they left open uh, for a uh, future day. Uh, what is the quantum of education necessary uh, to exercise basic constitutional rights? Um, and that's the issue that um, Judge Smith in our case did join. Uh, that language is ambiguous. I don't think anybody can deny that. If you look at what Powell said in response to Thurgood Marshall, what's a quantum of education? Um, you know, it's a very ambiguous term. Uh, to make uh, a long story short, uh, Judge Smith in this case said, yes, we, uh, I agree the Supreme Court left this issue open and um, as a federal judge, I have, a, I have an obligation to address that issue. So in my reading of that ambiguous language, um, I think Justice Powell meant that the quantum of education is very minimal and it basically means no education at all. Or in another place he said, it might mean minimum functional literacy, knowing how to read and write. But it certainly doesn't um, come up to the level of the kinds of things that Jen was describing that we believe um, young people and old people need to really understand the issues, to understand what voting means, what the separation of powers is, the things that Nancy was talking about, uh, to understand constitutional values, uh, to have uh, uh, media literacy that should be taught in the schools so kids can distinguish between accurate and inaccurate information before they make decisions about voting or any other life decisions. So we are looking for a robust definition of uh, civic education and uh, broad decision, broad meaning, and certainly a lot more than just minimal reading and writing. That's our difference with uh, Judge Smith. But the way Judge Smith set it up, the issue is ripe for decision by a panel of the Court of Appeals uh, because um, there's ambiguous language he interpreted very narrowly. He didn't explain why he said uh, it has to be so narrowly uh, construed. He didn't give any citations. He um, interpreted some ambiguous language. And fundamentally what our appeal is gonna be about is we're gonna write a brief that's first of all gonna quote Judge Smith at length where he talks about how uh, the future of our whole democracy depends on improving civic education. He said our democracy is at peril if the plea of these young people is not heard, it's really an eloquent decision. You should all read it. He goes on for 20 pages to explain what the meaning of civic education is, how our democracy is in peril. But he gives one line about what the quantum of education is. So we're gonna to go to the um, uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals and we're gonna to say to the panel of judges, we agree the language is ambiguous Judge Smith interprets it one way. We're asking you to interpret in the way that gives that clause real substantive meaning. And we think you'll agree that to be effective citizens, uh, you have to have a, a fundamental decent education, not just learning how to read and write in a minimal sense. So that's the core legal issue. And um, uh, Martha, if uh, uh, you'd like to begin a question and sure. comment period, we'd be very happy to respond to what people would like to talk about. Absolutely, thank you so much for those amazing presentations. Um, I'm wondering what a win um, either at the, the appeals court or at the Supreme Court would mean. Um, what, what, what's your you know, overall vision uh, and how do you think it would affect things like in, in Rhode Island or in New Hampshire? Okay, let me, let me try to handle that one first and then Jen may want to add on to it. Um, uh, let me say, first of all, what a win in the First Circuit would mean is uh, that probably uh, the governor and the other defendants uh, would then appeal to the US Supreme Court. But what it would immediately mean, uh, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with what a Circuit Court of Appeals is, the United States is divided into 12 judicial circuits. So those are regional, the, the intermediate court between the local district courts and the US Supreme Court. Um, the First Circuit covers Rhode Island, it covers Massachusetts, and interestingly, it covers New Hampshire. 
Um, so if we win, it means that would be the law for not only Rhode Island, but it would immediately be the law for Massachusetts and for New Hampshire and for Maine. And uh, I think Puerto Rico is in the first circuit. Um, and unless that's reversed by the US Supreme Court, Rhode Island, um, uh, New Hampshire, as well as Rhode Island would get the benefits of it. Um, but what would those benefits be? Well, uh, whether uh, the, the right is declared uh, and uh, for some reason the governor decides not to appeal um, or if it's appealed and we win in the Supreme Court, it's gonna come down to the same thing as far as New Hampshire is concerned. We gave a lot of thought to the strategy of exactly what we're gonna ask the courts to do. And what we decided was to ask for a declaratory judgment. And what that means is we want the federal courts to declare that there is this right, that you need a robust civic education to exercise your federal constitutional rights. But after that, we said, you don't have to do any more federal court. You just tell the states, you tell the legislatures, the governors, the educators, make this a priority. This is a robust, substantial right. And then it goes back to them to figure out how to do it. So we think it's a good balance of states' rights, of local control. Um, really, all we're asking people to do, we, we think educators know how to respond to this. We think that uh, if they get this impetus, it'll be a catalyst for them to do the right thing and to figure out uh, how to go about it. So, um, you know, we've been working and Jen has been organizing a lot of those groups in Rhode Island saying, you know, if we win this case, what it means is you've got a lot of hard work because you've got the guys who are going to have to go to the legislature, go to your local school districts and say, the Supreme Court said you've got to make this a high priority. We think to make it a high priority, you've got to do the following 10 things. Now, I'm not writing that list for them. Jen's not writing that mm -hmm. list. They have to write the list and they have to figure it out. So I'll say the same thing to the people in New Hampshire who are listening to us. If you think our case is plausible, start writing your list and start organizing to get the government to really finally grab hold of this issue. I know you've had 25 years of endless Claremont cases and back and forth. This can be the, the trigger that can pull that together and make it happen. And I'll defer to Nancy on this point. And most of our plaintiffs who were high school age at the time when we brought the case have said to me over and over again, I'm doing this for my younger siblings. I'm doing this for the kids who are coming up behind me because I want them to have a more enriched experience that addresses all of the things that Nancy called out that she did not receive as part of her formal education. And to me, this is the beautiful part about this case is that the remedy is actually a robust exercise in action civics. Because if, this, if we actually shift the terrain and the court, either the appeals court or the Supreme Court rules that there is a right in the constitution to be prepared to exercise your constitutional rights, then all across the nation, civic organizations like your own and educators and citizens are going to engage in a process of defining what do you really need to know to be an informed citizen? And we're not even asking ourselves that question as a nation in public education right now. Part of our goal in bringing this litigation is to pose that question and get people talking about it. So thank you for talking about it. But if we win, that's the result. It will be a deep, and broad exercise in civics for each of the states to define mm. that in their public education system. Thank you. We have some, some great questions. Um, the first one is from Elizabeth DeBrule, um, who would like to hear more about why social studies was marginalized in the first place. Uh, it seems that it is related to the shift um, among parents and the public that education is essentially jobs centered and most people think social studies won't lead to jobs. Um, was that borne out in your research? Uh, I think it very definitely was. Um, in the um, early days of the common school system, um, 
there was this emphasis on civic education. That was the reason that Horace Mann and the other founders of the common schools uh, said we need the schools. Um, it was really during the um, uh, turn of the century into the 20th century that more and more education became emphasized on uh, preparation for the job market. Now, you know, certainly people have to be educated to get good jobs and to uh, earn a living. Um, uh, but I think the question is well, very well phrased because uh, that balance has been out of kilter, at least for the last 50 years. And maybe uh, one way to understand what we're trying to do is put a balance back. Uh, and certainly people should be prepared for um, whatever um, areas of, of occupations they may want to go into, but not to the detriment of preparing them for citizenship, um, which is a skill all of us need, whatever profession we're going to go into. Thank you. Um, another uh, question from Matthew Dolezal. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, he wants to thank you for all your efforts to promote the construct um, of our government. And would it be outside of your expertise to comment on whether sensational misinformation distribution platforms and their commercial value are an opposing weight on the scale for civic education? Um, is there a legal way to address the emotional hold that the artificial intelligence-based social media platforms have on civic consciousness? Well, there's a lot embedded in that question, um, but I mean, the way that I've been thinking about this case, and um, I invite Nancy, of course, and Michael to comment, but whatever the operating environment is that we find ourselves in, in the 21st century, in the 22nd century, we can't really predict how human beings will communicate differently and how information will be disseminated differently. What we can know is that in order for us to participate in the decision-making opportunities we have as citizens in this country, we need information about how all that works. And so, you know, just in the last week, I'm on a, a group of, um, of librarians that send information and share information. And they're very alarmed that many schools, particularly during the pandemic, are laying off their librarians. And Michael referred to media literacy. If we don't know how to evaluate information, then we're really lost in terms of making informed choices about the direction that our country is taking. And I think Nancy might have something to comment on that as well, since she just went through this process. Yeah, um, like with, I think right now, especially like school going virtual, they are like the most important people or the most resourceful people at this time. And for them to not be here, I, I think there's a lot of problems with that um, because in school we're not taught, like many students are not taught how to um, check their sources. And I didn't get that till my first year of college and how to do MLA format or APA or anything like that, we're not taught that. And to know what we're talking about, knowing if things are right because there's so many things on social media going around and it's so easy to believe what's on the media and not do your own research. So. Thank you. Um, Nancy, while you're, while you're speaking, I have a question for you from Nancy Dorner. Um, and she wants to thank you all for a very good presentation and she wants to congratulate Nancy on taking action to ensure that you have the needed education and tools to become an informed citizen. Um, she said she suspects your parents are very proud of you. And would you mind sharing your current plans as to your college major and possible career path? Thank you so much. Um, as for my parents being proud, I, I'm not sure they're proud yet. Um, because again, they don't understand the importance of this, the importance of voting and all that. Um, but maybe in the future. Uh, and with, I'm a sophomore at Rhode Island College. 
I haven't declared a major, but I'm most likely going to do community and public health promotion with a focus on pre-med. And I hope to become a doctor one day and to advocate for our communities. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, a question from Andrew Walensky. In the state equity funding cases, this approach to remedy was taken. I don't trust states to do the right thing. What is your sense of how well this approach has worked in the various state Supreme Courts across the country? And he said, thank you very much for the presentation. He enjoyed it. Okay. Um, well, let me just thank Andrew for all the work I know he's done um, to try to uh, bring justice to New Hampshire's school children. He was the attorney in the original Claremont case and uh, uh, Andrew has just uh, stuck with this and, and been a tremendous force for positive change in New Hampshire and nationally. Um, but in response to his question, um, you know, the same way that Jen was saying that people in Rhode Island have been frustrated by the fact that the uh, state Supreme Court turned down their request not once but twice. Well, New Hampshire is an example of a state where the state Supreme Court wrote some wonderful decisions. You know, I quoted briefly, they go on for pages talking about the importance of civic education. Um, we're gonna quote a lot of that in our brief to the First Circuit. Uh, but then the follow-up, uh, as many of you know, has been uh, less than adequate. Let me leave it that way. But what I can say will come out of um, uh, a victory for us in our case is um, you're gonna have another option. And that option would be to go to federal court if the uh, governor, the legislature, the powers that be in New Hampshire continue to drag their feet on providing the kind of adequate education that the Claremont court very well outlined. Um, and I do think that if it's declared as a national right, that registers with people. They understand that the US Supreme Court has said they have a right to this. It will become a priority. And I'm sure if people like Andrew will stick with it, uh, great things will happen in New Hampshire and other places around the country. Well, what's your sense of the, the current US Supreme Court and its um, potential uh, attitudes about this, this, this particular issue? Well, um, let me address that first. And I think Jen will agree, but if she has a different uh, perspective, um, uh, that will be interesting also. Um, we have really bent over backwards to make this a bipartisan case. And you know, it is very interesting. Fiscal equity, uh, which I fought for, which Andrew and others fought for, much more controversial in a political sense. Um, you know, people on the left tend to be in favor of a lot more spending for social welfare, for education. People on the right uh, are less interested in government uh, becoming uh, uh, much more involved in these things. But when it comes to civics, uh, we all want our young people to be good citizens. And um, uh, I don't see the makeup of the Supreme Court or the First Circuit uh, as being polarized the way they are on some other issues. Uh, I think we're gonna get a good hearing uh, no matter who's on that bench. And um, judges in particular understand the importance of civics. Uh, they deal with it every day. When Jen mentioned jury service, voting, how many voting rights cases has the Supreme Court gotten this week and they're gonna get next week and the week after. They know the importance of these values. Their job is to uphold the constitution. Um, so it happens that um, many judges have expressed great interest and have done a lot of work in civics. I just wanna give one example. Chief Justice John Roberts, every year um, issues uh, an end of the year state of the judiciary um, report. And last year in December, this past December, he dedicated his whole report to the issue of teaching civics to our young people. And what he did is talk about some judges in different parts of the country that have had active programs welcoming high school students into the courthouse, going out on law day and teaching about the rule of law. And um, he praised these people and he basically told all the other federal judges, you ought to do more of this kind of thing. 
our judge cited that, that um, report from the chief justice. It, it really resonated throughout the federal system. Uh, so if Judge uh, John Roberts thinks this is the most important thing that he could write about in December of 2019, if we can get to the Supreme Court, I know he's going to give us a fair open hearing. And I can tell you, um, uh, Justice Sotomayor is the head of a civic uh, education organization. Justice Gorsuch just wrote a book about the importance of civic education. So wherever these judges stand on other issues, on this one, I think we're going to get an open mind if we can get there and make the case. Thank you. Um, I agree that that's one of the joys of working in this particular field is that um, it seems like one of the very few things that everybody agrees with. <laughs> um, there are disagreements more about how to, but everyone agrees that we need to do better and we need to do more. Um, and there's a question that's sort of on that topic. If civic education is meant to go K through 12, what does it look like at the early levels? Who designs the appropriate curriculum and regulations and who approves curricula to ensure their compliance so we don't fall into the same patterns of unequal schooling, um, this time unequal civic education across different districts? Um, so that has a number of different, the different questions within it. One thing I wanna say is, um, you can find high quality civic education curricula um, on our, in our, in our curriculum library. If you go to nhcivics.org, the New Hampshire Historical Society has a, a curriculum designed for grade four called Moose on the Loose. So there are many wonderful resources. It's not that we don't have resources. Um, uh, in terms of who designs it, um, I think, teachers really do that or it happens at the, at the local level. Um, anyway, uh, the, the question of, of, um, of unequal civic education is, is one I think for, for our, our panelists. <laughs> How do we make sure that um, it's just not, it's not another thing that's done in a really inequitable way? Well, I think as you've pointed out, Martha, there are actually tremendous resources already available for civic education at every level. Um, it's a question of making space for it within the public education setting. Because we've, we point to in our complaint the fact that some school districts around the nation are doing a great job and have fully integrated, adequate civic preparation K to 12. It's just a core part of what students are engaged in, in both formal academics, experiences, and knowledge. Um, and those resources are out there. It's just, it, they've been crowded out of the schoolhouse and making space for that. And, and then the resources can flood back in based on the judgments of local educators as to which emphasis they wanna take, which kinds of approaches, but there has to be space in the in public education and priorities. I think Michael used the word priority and that's one that I see as the most important to this work because unless it's a priority to make sure that all of our young people are having those learning opportunities, then it will not happen. And so we're really trying to shift a power dynamic and say, no, this is a nationally articulated priority protected by the constitution. So let's get serious about it. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything they, they would like to say in conclusion. We have about one more minute. Um, I, I am very grateful um, to, to all three of you um, and to everyone here tonight for being part of this conversation. It's such an important issue. And I think so many people see that it's, it's a crucial issue um, to our nation and, and to, to all, all citizens, <laughs> um, everyone who lives here. Um, we just have to make it happen. We have to prioritize it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we're having the conversation. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for that. Does, John, did you want to no, add I've anything? Just echo that. Thank you. Um, um, uh, it's really interesting, the idea of, of um, um, seeking to involve the judiciary uh, in this effort in the way that you have. And it'll be really, uh, I'll, I'll really watch with keen interest to see how this case develops as it moves on up through the appellate process. Because as you point out, um, 
New Hampshire is in the First Circuit. So what the First Circuit decides um, is not just relevant to the state of Rhode Island, but has broad impact throughout our region. Um, thank you so much um, for your time today and, and for telling us about the case. Um, uh, and Nancy, thanks so much uh, for sharing your story with us too. We really appreciate that. Okay, thank you all. And a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.